Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. My name is Pastor Bree. It is my joy to serve with the saints of St. Paul's United Methodist Church. So welcome saints, welcome friends, welcome guests and visitors. Welcome those of you joining us online. Uh, We've been praying for you this week and we trust that you will be blessed as we worship together. As we begin our worship service, I have a lot of announcements, so I'm going to try to go quickly. Things are written down in your bulletin. You can talk to me after the service or contact the office if you miss some details. First, a reminder that we will have some refreshments and fellowship following the service. Today's goodies have been provided by Peg Cargill. Our church spring cleanup is coming on May 4th, so if that's not on your calendar yet, please put it on your calendar. Many hands make it much more fun. Uh, We are donating books to our friends at Hamilton, which is the school across the street. Uh, If you would like to donate a book for our young friends, uh, you can do so starting today. It's $2 per book. You can write a little message inside. If you don't want to write a message inside, that's fine too. The books will still be appreciated. Speaking of books, the United Women of Faith at Trinity United Methodist Church are having a used book sale on April 19th and 20th, so it's a good chance to come out uh, and find some new books for your shelves. The United Methodist Church General Conference, which is the gathering of representatives from around the globe, will finally be held on April 23rd through May 3rd, which is coming up very quickly. Uh, We encourage you to continue to hold the larger church in prayer as we approach this conference. The Thursday evening women's Bible study group is inviting you to join them for a day of worship and rejuvenation on July 18th. Uh, The information is in your bulletin, or you can talk to Christine Bonk if you would like to know more. Heather will be in the office this week on Monday from 5 to 6.30, and on Friday from 4 to 5.30. And of course, you can reach me by cell phone, by email, by text, or by appointment. I apologize, I went out of order. I try so hard to go in order. Uh, There's an insert in your bulletin this morning. We are trying to be better neighbors to one another. And so we're looking for folks who might be willing to make visits, might be willing to make phone calls, might be willing to send cards and notes uh, to members of our church family. And on the other side of that is if you know somebody who might appreciate a visit or a phone call or a note or a card, uh, there's a place on this insert for you to put that information as well. Uh, We just want to make sure that we are taking care of each other and that we are staying connected. So we're asking that you please fill this out. There's a basket in the back of the sanctuary. You can put it in the offering plate. You can hand it to me. You can give it to Heather in the office. Uh, However you would like to return it to us, uh, letting us know how you might be willing to help us uh, love one another. And again, if there are folks who you know might benefit from that ministry. A couple of announcements that are not on the screens this morning. Um, I'd like to invite Orlin to come forward uh, and tell us a little bit about Sunday School. Good morning. I just wanted to remind you that after two weeks of no Sunday school, we're going to have Sunday school again this morning downstairs. And it, the topic is, does God choose who can be saved? It's essentially a talking about the doctrine of election. If you need to come and hear about it. Uh, the uh, whole list of the Sunday school topics is in the uh, messenger, if you missed it. Uh, next week it's going to be uh, what does God be- uh, what does believe in your heart mean and it goes on others will be talking about later look at your uh, messenger and you can see all the other topics going up through May 19th so be sure to come down about 12 uh, 11 15 after the uh, coffee break take bring your cookie and coffee down there and um, come to your Sunday school. Thank you. Thank you, Orlin. 
Uh, one more announcement uh, that did not make the bulletin this week. We are planning for Scout Sunday. Uh, our scouts will be here with us in worship two weeks from now on April 28th. Uh, we have more information next week for you, but we wanted to make sure you get that date in your calendar. Uh, they're planning to have their court of awards. They would love to have you stay and be a part of that. We're talking about having a potluck, um, all sorts of ways that we can uh, show love and support for our scout troop. Uh, so again, I'll have more details next week, but wanted to get it on your calendar. Told you, we're a busy church right now. All right, friends, let's, uh, let's take a few moments to stand and greet one another with the peace of Christ, and then we'll sing our first hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Join me in the call to worship. Come all you who carry joy and pain in your hearts. We bring our full selves before God. We gather, trusting that all our emotions are sacred. We know that in God's presence, every part of us is welcome. In our worship, may our whole selves encounter the loving kindness of God. We give thanks for God's grace, mercy, and love. May be seated. Scripture today is Romans 12, 14 through 18. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be arrogant, but associate with the lonely, lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought of for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. The word of God for the people of God. I'd like to invite the children to join me for the children's message at this time. You're very speedy today. Yeah. Well, welcome back. It's good to see you. You can sit if you want. You can stand if you want. I'm going to stand because I think if I sit down there, I'll be stuck. <laughs> well, we are talking in church about Mr. Rogers. Do you know who Mr. Rogers is? Yeah? You know Daniel Tiger? Yeah, my friend, my kids know Daniel Tiger. Mr. Rogers was around way back when I was a kid. He had a TV show that taught us how to be good neighbors, how to love each other, and how to be good friends. And one of the things that Mr. Rogers did really, really well is he taught kids it's okay to be sad, and it's okay if sometimes you get mad. Now, when I was growing up, we had grown-ups who liked to say things like, big girls don't cry, right? Or don't be mad. Put your mad feelings away. But Mr. Rogers said everybody gets mad sometimes, even grown-ups. Everybody gets sad sometimes, even grown-ups. It does not mean there's something wrong with you. That's how God made us, to have all kinds of feelings. We have good feelings too, right? Sometimes we feel happy. Sometimes we feel silly. And those are good feelings to have. But whatever you feel is okay. Now, you have a choice what you do with your feelings, right? If you get mad and you throw a big tantrum and you break a whole bunch of things, you might get in trouble. That might not be a good choice to make. But if you get mad and you say, Mom, I just need to be mad right now, then maybe Mom can help you work through those feelings instead of saying, you're not mad. Don't be mad. In our scripture for today, in our reading from the Bible, it says rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. It says part of the way that we love each other is by when somebody is silly, we can be silly with them. When somebody is happy, we can be happy with them. And when somebody is sad, we can be sad with them. And that's part of how we love each other is by sharing our feelings. So we're going to thank God for giving us all our feelings and ask God to help us love each other. And we're going to invite all our grown-up friends to pray with us too as we talk to God together. Dear God, thank you for our happy feelings. And thank you for being with us when we're sad and mad. Help us to love each other, no matter how we feel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks for coming up to see me today. is our oldest daughter. She is 14 and a half now. And she has...
has a long-standing love for musical theater. In the not quite three years since we moved to Grand Rapids, not only has she seen many shows, but she's been a part of eight productions. And right now she is in the last week of rehearsals for her ninth. It is Sister Act Junior. It is this Friday and Saturday at 7 o'clock at East Kentwood High School. You can buy tickets at the door, you know, just in case you were wondering. But long before she found her way onto the stage, our daughter has been dramatic. It started even before she was born. She loved to cause drama by sitting in such a way that she would cut off the blood flow to mommy's brain. And so she made me one of those pregnant women who tended to pass out a lot. The drama started very young. When she was born with a head full of fiery red hair, we knew that we had to hold on for a crazy ride. Michaela's favorite toy as a child was the Fisher Price microphone. She used to pull out an old aerobics step and use it as a stage. When she was just two and three years old, she would put on shows for us every day. Michaela has always been a dramatic little creature, but she has also tended at times to be overly dramatic. She engages in melodramatic reactions to the world around her. This is my child who was so terrified by the sight of an ant crawling on the sidewalk that she turned to run away and tripped and fell on the pavement and skinned both her knees bloody. This is my child, and we have video evidence. She would play very happily with Daddy while I was at work, but as soon as she heard me open the door, baby Michaela would turn on the waterworks and crawl over to the baby gate and try to guilt me into believing that she had been crying the whole time that I was gone. She's the kind of kid who always needs a Band-Aid for her boo-boos. She cried and she screamed with every little scrape to the point where we started telling her the story of the little girl who cried wolf. If you tell us you're in agony with every little bump and bruise, how will we ever know that you're really hurt, that you're really in a lot of pain? But she didn't really understand the point of the story. So she continued to be a drama queen and we learned to be a little bit slower to react because most of the time, all she needed was a kiss and a Band-Aid. Then we came to fall 2016. Michaela was about seven years old. She was just starting first grade, and we were living in the Ypsilanti Parsonage. Now, one of the gifts of that parsonage is that it had a rec room. We called it the playroom. It was a room just for the kids. It was full of toys and books and games. There was a TV to watch movies. There was even a little dance studio set up in the corner. And there was a big old couch for the kiddos to curl up on. Now, Michaela developed a habit of laying on the back of the couch, not the seat where you were supposed to be, but up on the back of the couch, which might have been fine if the couch was pushed up against the wall. But it was sort of floating out in the middle of the room. And the floor was carpeted, but it was kind of like the carpet we have in here. It's not particularly cushy. And so we tried to warn Michaela, don't lay on the back of the couch. If you fall off the back, you could really get hurt. And she listened to us about as well as any stubborn and strong-willed first grader ever listens. She learned not to lay on the back of the couch when we were close enough to see her. So we come to September 2016, and one afternoon, Mike and I were working in the other room when we heard very familiar screams come from the playroom. Now, we were hardened and skeptical by this point. So we did not go running, we just waited. And inevitably, Michaela came into the room. She said, I hurt my arm. And we said, how did you hurt your arm? And you will never guess what happened. She fell off the back of the couch. 
So we looked at her arm and it looked fine. We pressed on it. We moved it around. It all seemed to be okay. So we gave her a kiss. We gave her a lecture. We said, don't lay on the back of the couch anymore. And we sent her back to the playroom and Mike and I went back to work. Now, maybe 20 minutes later, Michaela came back into the room where we were working. She said, my arm still hurts. It hurts when I do this. Yeah, my husband, in the proud tradition of dads everywhere, told her, don't do that. <laughs> now, her arm still looked fine. There was no swelling. There was no bleeding. There was no bruising. So we gave her a little ice pack. We settled her back on her couch on the seat of the couch where you're supposed to sit. And Mike and I went back to work. And after another half an hour or so, Michaela came, and this time she came to me. She said, Mom, my arm still hurts. And even for Michaela, an hour was a really long time to complain about another one of her imaginary injuries. So I looked at her arm again, and there was maybe just a little bit of swelling. And she was just a little bit shaky, like not quite her normal self. And I said to Mike, I think maybe she really did hurt herself. Mike's schedule was a little less flexible than mine that day, so I was the one who loaded Michaela into the car, and we drove to the emergency room. And even all the way there, I was asking her, does it really still hurt? Because I was sure we were going to the emergency room for nothing. When we got there, they took her for x-rays, and then they told me, you know, her arm is broken. And they said, not only is it broken, but it's broken in such a way that we're not comfortable taking care of it here. We're going to send you guys to the Children's Hospital at the University of Michigan. Now, I immediately called Mike, who jumped into daddy guilt mode. Because we didn't believe her, and we moved her arm all around when it was broken. And he said, what can I do? And I said, she's going to have a cast. And so we need some button-up loose shirts that we'll be able to get on over the cast. And so Mike said, I can do that. He went to the store. He got her some shirts, and he got a Care Bear. And he got a coloring book, and he got a book to read, and a book of puzzles, and a bunch of Michaela's favorite treats because he was feeling so guilty. Michaela ended up having to have surgery to put pins into her broken arm. She navigated the next month and a half in a cast that went from her fingertips to her armpit. And I'd like to think she learned something about not crying wolf, but mostly Mike and I learned that even if your daughter does cry wolf, sometimes the wolf is real. Sometimes where there are tears, there's an actual injury. Now we're spending this season after Easter revisiting the lessons of Mr. Rogers, learning how to be better neighbors. We started last week with a reminder about listening Listening to other people's voices and truths, listening first and meeting them where they are, right? Mike and I did not model good listening when our daughter was hurt. But today's theme takes us even further with the reminder that as a part of listening, before we can move forward, we need to validate feelings, other people's feelings and our own. And, and I've been thinking about Michaela's broken arm this week and how Mike and I failed, now, understandably, maybe, but still, we didn't listen to her pain. We didn't believe that she was hurting. In fact, we denied it. We told her, you're fine. It's okay. You're overreacting. We tried to talk her out of what she felt. It was not our finest moment. Thankfully, she stuck to her truth. She persisted in trying to communicate her pain, and as a result, she was finally able to get the help that she needed to heal. One of the things that Mr. Rogers did so well was not just listening to children and to adults, but validating feelings. He taught us that emotions by themselves are not bad. Everyone is sad sometimes. Everyone is angry. Everyone gets hurt. Whatever you feel, it is a normal human emotion. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes we tend to hold kids to a higher standard than we hold ourselves when it comes to feelings, right? 
I'm allowed to have a bad day. I'm allowed to be cranky. I'm allowed to lose my temper. But if my kids do it, it's not okay. Mr. Rogers said, you know what? We're all human. You feel what you feel. And that's real. And you have a right to feel it and a right to be heard. It's a very liberating and empowering and very countercultural message in a world where children are told they should be seen and not heard. Where children are told that big girls and big boys don't cry and, and good kids don't get angry and some feelings are just not acceptable. Some feelings are not okay. And it's not just children who internalize that message. Think how often we as adults, we put on our outside faces do you ever come to church and you put on your church face? You kind of pretend that everything's okay, even if it's not. You hide whatever's hurting, whatever doubt you're wrestling with, whatever grief or pain you're going through, and you just put on a smile and say, oh, how are you? I'm great. I'm doing well. Everything is fine. And, and some churches have even told us that that's what you're supposed to do. I've met Christians who told me that grief is an insult to God. Because Christians don't grieve. If you grieve, then you don't really believe that death has lost its sting. Now, what I find Scripture saying is not that we don't grieve, but rather that we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We still grieve. We just have hope that death is not the end. The same Jesus who wept at the tomb of his friend understands and shares and makes room for our grief too. I've also heard preachers who like to come back to the book of James. Now there's some wonderful stuff in James. James is where you get right faith without works is dead. You need to show what you believe by how you live. But James also didn't have a lot of room in his theology for doubt. Don't doubt. If you doubt, you'll be like a wave tossed on the wind. And, and so there are preachers who take that to say, you should never doubt. If you doubt, then you're not a good Christian. But it seems to me that doubt is a necessary part of our faith. If we knew everything for sure, we wouldn't need faith. But it may be that doubt strengthens our faith, just like your muscles get stronger when you lift up heavy things. Our faith gets stronger when we try it, when we test it, when we have that resistance and that weight of doubt. And I'm reminded how Jesus, Jesus who was God in the flesh, Jesus was on the cross and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If Jesus could feel that way, then there is room for our doubt and our agony too. It's one of the reasons I love the book of Psalms. The Psalms are the prayer book, the hymn book of God's people throughout the years. And if you read through the Psalms, there are Psalms that are full of praises and thanksgiving, but there are also Psalms for grief, Psalms for doubt, Psalms for pain and big questions and uncertainty and fear. And in our scripture for today, we're reminded that a big part of how we love each other, a big part of how we live in community is by meeting each other in the spectrum, in the range of our emotions, rejoicing with those who rejoice, but also grieving with those who grieve. And maybe before we can rejoice or grieve with one another, before we can validate each other's feelings, we have to learn to accept and work with and validate our own. In her book, The Mr. Rogers Effect, Dr. Coonley discusses, based not just on a study of Mr. Rogers, but based on her years of experience as a counselor, she says, if you can mention it, you can manage it. So if you can talk about something, you can begin to process it and heal it. There are so many things that we try to deny, that we bury and hide away. And part of the healing power of counseling is that it brings that stuff to the surface. It gives us a space to name what we're going through. And, and as we name it, we begin to deal with it. It doesn't become this big, scary monster in the closet. It is something that we can process. It is something that we can heal from. 
And as I've lived with this this week, as I've wrestled with this idea of validating feelings, I was reminded again of the story we told last week about Jesus and Lazarus and his sisters. Remember, Jesus' friend Lazarus died, and, and Jesus kind of took his time getting there. And when he finally shows up, his grieving, the grieving sisters of the dead man, they meet Jesus full of anger and accusations and pain, and Jesus doesn't scold them for that. He, he doesn't minimize or deny what they're feeling, but he meets them there. He even cries with them. But I've also been reminded of the story of the prophet Elijah. Now, Elijah was a prophet during a time when Israel had abandoned God and the people were worshiping false idols. And so Elijah tried to hold on to what was true. He tried to preach and proclaim the truth and call the people to come back and be faithful to God, but he just ended up burned out. He was miserable. He was overworked. He was overextended and discouraged. There was a, a bounty on his head. He was running for his life. He was frustrated and hurting, and he just felt tired and alone. So Elijah runs away. He runs into the wilderness, and he meets God there. And God doesn't give him a guilt trip. God doesn't accuse him of falling short or lying down on the job. God gives him a snack and tells him to take a nap. Now, I think Mr. Rogers would agree that a lot of us, when we are overwhelmed with big feelings, sometimes would do well to have a snack and a nap. And so Elijah has a snack and a nap, and then God listens to his frustrations. God makes room for Elijah to express his pain, and he helps him begin to heal, to find a way forward. He reassures Elijah, no matter how it feels, you can get through this, and you are not alone. Wherever you are on your own journey, whatever you're feeling today, there is room for your feeling in God's story. There's room for frustration. There's room for disappointment. There's room for doubt and grief and fear. You don't have to hide your pain. You don't have to bury it or deny it. It's welcome here. God who made us God made us to feel this whole array of feelings. We don't have to pretend to be happy all the time. We can be honest about what we're feeling. We can be honest with ourselves and honest with each other and honest with God. We can come just as we are. And we can learn how to validate our feelings without being controlled by them. Our scripture from Romans, which talks about rejoicing and grieving together, it comes in the middle of a conversation about how to live as Christians. The church in Rome was a church that was full of conflict and divisions. There were people from all these different racial backgrounds and cultural backgrounds and economic and religious backgrounds, and they were trying to figure out how do we live together when we're so different and so Paul writes them this letter and he says, this is how you should live as Christians. Let your love be sincere. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to each other. Honor other people above yourself. Share with those who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless everyone, even those who curse you. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with humility. Don't pay back evil for evil. But in as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And he goes on to say, don't take revenge. But if you see your enemy and he's hungry, give him something to eat. If you see your enemy and he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. See, we started this series by naming that we are in a general conference year. We're in an election year. We're a part of a community and a denomination and a nation where we still struggle to be good neighbors. We struggle to figure out how we can love each other when we don't agree on very important things. 
And we started by saying, let's start by listening to each other. Today, we're meeting each other in our feelings. We can't make progress just by talking about ideas. We have to engage our hearts as well. And Paul gives us advice on how to do that, how to grow in our faith by living it out and putting it into action. He says, meet your enemies, the people who disagree with you, meet them with compassion. In as much as it's up to you, try to live at peace with each other. And I like the idea that it's possible to live at peace even in our differences, to figure out how we can love each other and bless each other even when we don't agree. And our way to make progress, our way towards peace starts with listening And acknowledging how we're feeling while choosing in as much as it's up to us not to be controlled by our emotions, not to be controlled by our grief or our pain or our fear, but to be controlled by compassion and driven by Christ's love. Dr. Coonley suggests if if we can mention our feelings, if we can talk about it and name them, we can manage them. And, And part of the way she says we manage our big feelings is not by denying or burying them, but channeling them into something like writing in a journal or taking a walk meditating, singing, having a conversation, building something, working to change the world around you, using that energy that our emotions give us in a productive and a healing way. And I find a lot of hope in that idea. So often we allow our emotions to control us, to drive us apart or drag us down, but we're invited this week to see them instead as gifts as energy that God gives us that helps us to know ourselves better and to respond to each other with compassion and to use that emotional energy to make the world a better place. So let's make room for our feelings this week. Room to be honest about where we are and how we feel and believe that God meets us right where we are. Believing that hope and healing are always possible as we thank God for the fullness of our human experience. Friends, let's pray. God, you have given us the gift of emotion. Because you didn't want to create a bunch of numb robots, you wanted to create children. Children who would be able to love and hope and dream and, yes, to grieve. Help us to believe that you meet us even in our pain. Help us to name and honor what we're feeling and to believe that when we feel stuck, you will bring us safely through to the other side. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As beloved children of God, we are invited to bring our tithes and our gifts for God's work today. We will work, work with each other, we will work. 
work side by side, and will guard each one's dignity and save, save each one's pride. We do thank you, God, for your love, your great love for us, your love which created us, your love which has called us to this place, your love which redeems us, forgives us, and empowers us to go forward. We ask that you would help us to live with love in this world. Take these, our gifts, bless them, use them to bear witness to your love so that many more may come to know you and to trust you as we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. We continue in worship as we share our prayer requests together. Uh, Judy asked for prayers for her son and daughter-in-law, Frank and Sherry. Sherry is still dealing with a lot of pain from bone cancer and is still bedridden, and so we pray for strength for Sherry. Jessica Gould asks for prayers for her mom who has hip surgery on Wednesday. We pray for a safe surgery and a quick recovery. And please uh, hold Kathy O'Neill's family in your prayers on the death of her brother. Let's take a few moments to be still as we lift these and all of our prayers before God today. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us to this time and to this place in our lives. We thank you for the ways that we have heard your voice, maybe not aloud, but whispering in our hearts all the same. For all the ways that we've known your love and seen your hand at work in our lives. We thank you for this community that you've invited us to be a part of, for this family for the love that we share, and for the assurance that no matter what the world says about us, you love us and we are yours. We thank you, God, for the ways we've seen you at work in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones this week, for prayers that you've answered, for comfort in the face of grief, for strength for all the challenges that we faced and your love and your grace to sustain us and see us through. We thank you for hearing our prayers today, those that we've named aloud and those that we lift in the silence for you alone to hear. Oh God, we pray for our loved ones, for church members and friends, for family members, for coworkers and colleagues and neighbors and acquaintances and all those who need your strength and your comfort and your healing touch today. God, we pray for our church for this community here, and, and as there are so many voices that try to pull us apart, help us to hear your voice calling us back together, to believe that even though we may not always agree, we still belong to one another because we belong to you. We pray for the larger church, 
As we approach this general conference, God, we ask that your voice would be heard, that your will would be done, that you would help us to stop fighting with one another, but to find a way forward. Oh God, we pray for our communities, for our neighbors and for our leaders, and we trust that you're at work here in the places where we live. Open our hearts and, and open our eyes to see what you're doing around us. Help us to bear witness to your love and your grace right where we live each day. God, we pray for our state, for our nation, and not only for our nation, but we pray for the whole world. We think especially today of those communities devastated by storms, earthquakes, tornadoes, fires, and flooding, and other disasters. For those places where neighbors are learning to lean on one another. And for those places where neighbors have turned against each other. We pray for households and communities and, and nations devastated by violence. For all those places in this world where injustice has the upper hand. For those who live in terror and fear surrounded by war. We pray for your children who are hungry who are thirsty, who are, who are desperate. We pray for immigrants and refugees and all those who are stuck in the midst of violence today. Oh God, pour out your healing presence. Send your spirit of peace upon this confused and scattered and hurting world. Help us to trust in you. Help us to follow you and may our lives bear witness to your love. Oh God, we lift these and all of our prayers in the name of Jesus, the risen Christ. And we join together this morning in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in worship this morning as we celebrate Holy Communion together. As United Methodist Church, we have what is called an open table. That means if you are here, you are welcome at the table. You do not have to be a member of this church or any church to receive communion with us today. In a few moments, we'll invite you to come forward by the center aisle. You'll receive a piece of bread and a small cup of juice. We also have gluten-free elements, if that is something that is helpful for you. Receive the bread and the juice as the body and the blood of Christ. If you wish to, you may pray at the railing or in our front prayer pew. And then when you are ready, you can make your way back to your seats by the side aisles. Uh, there are baskets there for you to leave your cup along the way. Friends, we continue then with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. 
By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. It says, my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of the bread and the wine. Make them to be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Bread which we break is the body of Christ broken for us. The cups over which we give thanks are filled with the blood of Christ poured out that we might live. For those who are assisting to serve, please come at this time. I invite you to come for all is ready.
Let's pray. We're so grateful, God, that you meet us just exactly where we are. And we are so grateful that you do not leave us there. May this meal that we have shared, this encounter with you, transform us, renew us, strengthen us for the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 432. We'll sing verses one through three of Yesu, Yesu. I invite you to stand if you're comfortable standing. Uh, the children and their teachers are dismissed to kids' time, and the rest of us will sing together. Beloved in Christ, as we go forth from this place, we go forth into God's neighborhood. May we share God's love with all those we encounter throughout this week, and may God's love fill our hearts with joy, fill our hearts with hope, and fill our hearts with peace. All God's people said, amen.